there are all sorts of different windows in Dorchester. Um, they've all got a story to tell. It's not just about the buildings that they illuminate, but it's about function, it's about class. There's even a distant connection with the Great Fire of London um, and a suspicion of magic. The earliest windows in Dorchester have long disappeared, but the evidence for their form is still very, very clear in this building. Um, it's a very handsome timber frame building, jettied, um, and we know that this building was built in 1610. And the front elevation was covered with glass, glass set in leaded frames, um, projecting windows, what are called oriel windows. If you look at the framework, look closely, you will see that there are empty mortises in these uprights on this side and a matching empty mortises here on this side. And then if you look up underneath the jetty, where the line of those mortises are, there is another empty mortise with a peg still stuck in it and another one here. So you've got a framework projecting here out as far as the jetty. And in between, there are diamond shaped mortises and then rectangular ones. So diamond, rectangular, diamond, rectangular, diamond, rectangular, diamond. And then if you look at the flanking windows, these high windows, which were either side of this projecting oriel, you will see, if you look very closely, that inside there is a timber mullion that is set in a diamond pattern. And then there's a decorated mullion and a diamond one and a decorated one. The reason for the diamond shaped mullions is that leaded lights like this can move under pressure. So wind, or if you open a door and close it, then that can move. So if you tie it, in the center against a mullion like that, then that resists that pressure and it stays there. Um, so we've got all the evidence we need for the window here. And then if you look up there, you can see exactly the same evidence for the same sort of projecting window with flanking windows on either side. So you've got to see glass all the way along there. Then there's the chimney breast and then it's repeated there. So there was a lot of glass and we know that the White Hart, just further down the high street, had similar windows. But those windows um, were a fashion that was short-lived. Um, this was an inn, as was the White Hart, and it advertises your presence, but it's very hot in the summer and it's very cold in the winter. And they were soon replaced by much smaller windows. But there's one tiny window that still survives in Dorchester that shows you the basic form. And we'll go and look at that now. This is the Crown, uh, another former inn in Dorchester, another timber frame building. It's been totally refronted, so we don't know what the windows were like on the front. But if we go into the courtyard at the rear, we will find the last surviving oriel window in Dorchester. So come with me. So this is the oldest surviving window in Dorchester. And it's essentially the same form as the windows that we were looking at uh, in the high street. There we only had the evidence for their former existence. Here we have a window, a projecting window, an oriel window with high flanking windows on either side. One of those flanking windows has been blocked, but the other one is still there. And originally, and the evidence is here, um, there were mullions just as there were on that other window, diamond shaped ones behind the leaded casements and then rectangular ones for the moulded mullions in between. Now, the Crown was a flourishing inn right through the 19th century. In 1832, a young architect called John Harper, um, who was training in London, he came to Dorchester. I think he came to draw the Abbey, um, but he must have taken a room in the Crown 
And I'm sure it was this room because he drew this window. So it fascinated him. Um, he drew all sorts of details about it. There's a molded barge board on that side. It's gone on the other side, but it's there now. And Harper drew the detail of that. He could only have done that by leaning out of the window with a measuring rod, um, just as I'm doing now. Um, so we have a record from the 19th century of it, and it's still beautifully preserved today. The reason why this window survived is because it's in the yard at the back. It's not on the public elevation. The inns in Dorchester, they wanted to modernize periodically so that custom was attracted to them. Um, this in the backyard, they didn't bother to change. Um, and so it's been beautifully preserved. Further down the high street, we come to this house. Um, this has sash windows, and they are the next phase of development. Um, they're largely peculiar to this country. They come in in about 1670, and they're composed of moving sashes. That is, this whole uh, pane of glass here with its fat glazing bars, and this one up above, these are the sashes. They move vertically, um, by a system of pulleys and ropes and weights that are on either side of the window in what's known as the sash box. And early examples, uh, the whole window was flush or very nearly flush with the front elevation of the uh, building. Um, the earliest examples all have segmental headed windows uh, that's curving at the top. And so this is an early example in Dorchester. It's not as early as 1670. Um, fashions take a long time to move out into the countryside. Um, it's sometime, I think, after 1700. The next major stage in the development of the sash window was the 1709 London Building Act. That specified that the sash box containing the cords and the pulleys and the weights should be set back from the front elevation of the building by the depth of a brick, that is, by four inches. It was always said that this was because of the fear of fire, uh, which went back to the Great Fire of London. Well, the Great Fire of London was 40 years uh, previously, um, so I'm not sure if it was the exact reason for the 1709 Building Act, um, but it was a concern about fire spread in terraced houses in London. Now, the Act only applied to London, um, and it took time for its effects to be felt in the provinces. So when we see a building like this, where the sash windows are set back by a brick from the front elevation, all you can say is that it is after 1709. But do note the glazing bars. They're very much finer than they were on the previous building. And again, a development with sash windows. There's a move to make your glazing bars finer and finer so that you have more glass. That lets in more light and it gives you a better view out. A further development with the sash window was the Building Act of 1774. And that specified that the sash box should be concealed entirely behind the elevation of the building. Um, it applied only to London. Um, and so, like the 1709 Act, it took time before it had an impact on the provinces. Um, here in Dorchester, we can see it taking effect on a house that's dated 1797. The weakest part of a sash window is the bottom rail of the upper sash. Um, and you can strengthen that joint between the bottom rail and the side rails by extending the side rails further down, giving you the chance to put a mortise and tenon joint in and an opportunity for decoration in the remnant of timber that overlaps at the bottom. Those are known as horns, and this development takes place in London in the second half of the 19th century. Here we have an example in Dorchester that's dated 1860 um, and shows you just how decorative you can make your horns. Sash windows are normally 
found on grander buildings. Ordinary cottages, the windows tend to be casement windows. Um, as you see in the building behind me here, um, these casement windows are in wood. Earlier examples still have leaded lights and we'll see one very, very shortly. But most of these cottages are only one and a half stories high. That means that the upper story is partly in the roof space and is lit by dormer windows. Um, as you can see here, where the roof is thatched, that sweeps over those dormer windows in a very gentle curve. The rafters of the dormers are straight rafters that go up to the ridge. If we look to the building next to it, you will see that here the dormers have a gable. These are never thatched because the junction between the sides of those gable dormer windows and the rest of the roof is so sharp that the thatch would wear away very quickly and it wouldn't weather properly. If you look at the dormer windows here, you can see that the roof of this cottage was originally thatched. That long line from above the windows going back towards the ridge, that's where the thatch would have flowed over and you would have had the windows appearing like eyebrows. It's also got leaded casements um, and they are earlier than the wooden casements that we saw on the previous building. We've come inside to uh, take a closer look at one of these casement windows. Um, this is inside my own house, uh, which is further up the high street. It's a casement window with leaded lights. It still has a decorated mullion, but it's very much flatter than the mullions that we saw on those early Oriel windows. Um, and it doesn't have diamond-shaped mullions either to set the casements against. Here you've got metal bars laid horizontally along the line of the leaded lights so that you don't obscure the glass in any way. It's probably, I should think, late 17th century. Glass is still quite an expensive material. Um, so in the 16th century and through into the 17th century, people would leave their windows in their wills um, and they would be included in their inventories and assessment of their goods taken when they died. Um, so we're looking at something that is precious, that is valuable, and if you leave it in a will, the implication is that it, uh, the recipient can reuse it elsewhere. And these leaded lights are put into a metal casement, you can see it here, lift it off the pinples, and you can take it and put it in another house. There's one other feature about this casement window that's not immediately apparent, um, but when you look at it, it really is quite intriguing. Now, you need to remember the 17th century was still a very superstitious age. It was a time when we still persecuted witches. Um, people actually believed in evil spirits and they were frightened that they would come into their houses through openings. They might come down the chimney, they might come through the door, they certainly might come through the window. And so they took steps to keep those evil spirits away. And if you look at the mullion here, you'll see that there are two very finely carved daisy wheels. That's a six-petaled flower made with a compass a continuous line, and that continuous line was supposed to keep the evil spirits out, and it certainly seems to have been successful here. I've lived here for 40 years, and uh, I've yet to see an evil spirit. Somewhere between a sash window and a casement window is a window that's known as a Yorkshire sliding sash. This is very, very simple. It slides horizontally, in grooves, it doesn't need any uh, pulleys or any sash cords or anything, so it's cheaper to make and you tend to find it on cottages. Why it's called a Yorkshire sliding sash, I don't know. You do find them in Yorkshire, but you find them all over the country um, and they can be on quite dignified buildings. The George is perhaps the grandest inn in Dorchester and that's got Yorkshire sliding sash windows all over its front elevation. 
This is the former post office. It's one of a number of shops that lined the high street and it still retains its very early shop front. Um, the distinguishing feature of this shop front is that it bows out in the centre. It was designed like that, it's not uh, an accident. Um, I'm not quite sure why it was designed like that, but there are a number of shops in the locality with exactly that form of glazing. Uh, there's one at Blueberry and there's another one at Watlington. Um, so it's a mystery. Um, I know someone who's collecting these shop fronts and he calls them wonky windows. This is another of the early shop fronts in Dorchester. Exactly the same pattern of glazing bars, but here the shop front is slightly concave. Um, again, I don't know what the reason is, um, but it's a fine feature. What all these shop fronts do, of course, is have a large glazed area for display. And here on this building, along the ground floor, you can see projecting bow windows. Um, they are very modern. Um, they were put in by Hallidays, who are antique dealers, um, but they also used to do woodwork and make fireplaces and panelling and so on. And wherever you see a bow window in Dorchester, you can be pretty certain that that building belonged to Hallidays at one stage. Here at the north end of the village, in front of Willoughby House, the windows tell us a very subtle story. On one side, immediately behind me, um, the sash boxes are still exposed. And the reason for this is that what you're looking at is a facelift of the 19th century. This is essentially a late 15th century timber framed hall house and the front elevation is made of render. It's not deep enough to hide the sash boxes. So it gives it away that there's something different happening behind here. And then if you look at the far end of the house, you will see that the sash boxes are recessed and are hidden. And that tells you that that is an extension. It shows now because it's been painted a different color because they're now in separate ownerships, but they were once in a common ownership. That is a later extension and it's built with a solid wall. And if you look at the pattern of the uh, block work, you will see that it's subtly different to the earlier facade and the windows are different. They've got great big panes of glass. This is the late 19th century. You've got plate glass and you can do away with nearly all of your glazing bars. And so in a way, that's the end of the story of the sash window. One of the themes of this narrative has been that of change. Windows have changed according to fashion, according to new inventions, um, according to regulations that have been imposed in London. That theme of change really stopped with the Town and Country Planning Act of 1947 when buildings got listed. You now need permission to change your windows and the presumption is that your historic windows will remain and so they are here for us to enjoy the stories that they tell us.